Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're grateful this morning to know you. We're grateful to be a part of your family. We're grateful for the cross. We're grateful for the gospel. And Father, as we learn about you and as we worship you this morning, Father, may you speak to our hearts, may our ears be open. I pray for the church across the world today that, Father, they would be enlightened by you that the gospel would go out into all the world as a witness to you. And may you be glorified this morning. In the wonderful name of Jesus, amen. We'll be in the book of Psalms, Psalms chapter 2. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are those who put their trust in the Lord. It is shocking, the latest statistic there are 750 billion people in the world. 600 million people claim to be born again. And let's say that those numbers are correct. 8% of the population of the world is going to heaven. But it's also true that 92% are going to hell. Does that bother us? Does that bother us in our walk? I guess it depends on our walk with Jesus. On 9-11, people were running down the stairs to get out of harm's way while policemen and firemen were running upstairs to rescue those up there as the rescuers were running up the stairs into hell to save everybody they could the rescuers kept yelling get out get out quickly quickly if those statistics are correct and 600 million people claim to be born again which means 92 percent of the population of the world does not know christ where's the warning Yes, I know it's not popular. I know it's a hush, a hush word, the word of hell. But hell is real, and so is heaven. Everybody that is born on the planet is going to one place or the other. Yet people all over the world are being deceived. And in the church, there's no gospel to save them. It scares me to think about the 92%. I know when Cheryl and I got saved... We were afraid of hell. And so we gave our life to the Lord because we were afraid. People say, well, you can't scare people into hell. I mean, into heaven. Well, it scared Cheryl and I into heaven. And, um, of course, things change over time, but we knew that our life wasn't going to make it. We knew we deserved punishment. 
but Jesus stepped in and took our punishment for all of us. And for that we're grateful. He died on a cross. He bled his blood for us. He was buried and on the third day rose from the dead. Today it's about lights and music and crowds and partying, but the gospel is absent. The sad truth is many won't make it. Just think about it, a hundred years later in eternity is still a hundred years later. A million years later is a million years later. Those that don't come to Jesus through the gospel won't make it. And that should bother everybody in this parking lot this morning. That those that aren't, that those that aren't born again, those that haven't come to Christ through the gospel are not going to make it. Eternity is forever. For some, they respond, well, I'm saved, I'm good. Is this the attitude of some? Yes. But it's not enough to nod our head week after week. You remember the Titanic? When the Titanic went down, there was rescue boats all around the people in the water. Yet very few got on the boats. What happened? People say, yeah, William, but that's not my gifting. I'm glad to support it, but well, you know, Jesus said, take up your cross, not your cushion. Those close to walk and those on YouTube, time is running out for all of us. There should be an urgency to get the gospel message to everybody we possibly can. Jesus said, go out into all the world and preach the gospel. Tell them. Tell them close to walk to repent. Tell them to repent before time is too late. Repentance is is a beautiful gift that God gave humankind. Jesus sacrificed everything for us. So this brings me to the message that I want you to know in Psalms 2 is a prophetic picture of the coming kingdom, the coming Messiah's kingdom. And man's depravity on earth is on full display, devising and scheming. Nations and their leaders and their people direct their hostility towards God. And instead of seeing God as a loving father, they see him as someone that's reigning on their parade or in their way. This is the day we live in. In Psalms 2, it's really a contempt for God from the leaders, not only of our own nation, but worldwide. A disdain a mocking but I want to tell you verse 4 gives me great comfort because in verse 4 of Psalms 2 it says God sits in the heaven and laughs God knows in chapter 1 it says for the Lord knows the way of the righteous but the way of the ungodly shall perish the clock is ticking Jesus kingdom will come and I want you to know Closer Walk, it would be good for everybody in this parking lot to get a healthy dose of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of everything. Psalm 2 is the reign of the Messiah. And the Bible has much to say about the future. But that's not what I want to talk about this morning because in 2020 it's anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-scripture, anti-believer, anti-church, and anti-morality. Sharing Christ with others has become much more difficult. People don't want to hear it. Well, the other side is everybody's already saved, but is that true? If the statistics are true, 92% of the world's population doesn't know Jesus. Why would anybody fight against the Lord or take counsel against him? Depravity. For many, they have been turned over already. And Paul said, for many are the enemies of the gospel. The enemy so tears into the church, the body of Christ. While the church slept, the Bible says in Matthew that the enemy so tears they look like Christians, they act like Christians, they talk like Christians, they move like Christians, they dress like Christians. 
but they're tears, it's fake. What is my responsibility as your pastor that God entrusted you under my care as an under shepherd of the shepherd? It is my responsibility to make sure everybody in this group knows the true gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord. Many will gather teachers in the last days for themselves. They will want their itchy ears scratched. We don't like the preacher anymore. We don't like what he says or how he says it. Let's get rid of him. The people need the gospel. All of us have life principles that define us. Some are spoken, some are not. But our principles define us and whatever we pay attention to is where we draw our power from. In the book of Haggai it says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more I will shake the nations and shake the earth and the heavens and the sea and the dry land. This is a prophetic scripture about the coming Messiah's kingdom. People need the Lord. What's interesting to me is that God chose all of us to live in this time frame right now. Like he didn't choose us to live 100 years ago or 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago. God chose each one of you to live in 2020 right now with a great responsibility that you hold the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The question is, what are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with this truth that we've been given, this responsibility that we've been given? See, change has now come. You can see it. It will become harder and harder as the day is ahead to share your faith. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, if you will, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm so glad y'all brought your Bibles or your phones. It feels good to touch the pages of the Bible, doesn't it? It, ha it has a certain smell to it that I love. Psalm 2 is a prophetic scripture about the coming kingdom. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 says, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? unless indeed you are disqualified. But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. Of course we're not disqualified if we have Christ in us. The scripture's not talking about whether you're saved or not. When you got saved, you got saved. You can't get more saved. But it's an interesting scripture because as a scripture to examine whether we're walking in the faith that we proclaim. You remember last week I talked about Paul was given a thorn in the flesh. That thorn was a stake. And, and, and God allowed a messenger of Satan to drive that stake into Paul. And as Paul pleaded with the Lord three times, please, Lord, take, take this stake out of me. Please take this stake away. Please, Lord, take this stake away. And God said, my grace is sufficient because my strength is made perfect in weakness. So we know that God's strength is made perfect in weakness, and we know that Paul was born again. But being born again doesn't mean we don't have stakes. And the reason the stake was given to Paul was to keep him humble. Does my faith equal my walk? Does what I say about the Lord equal how I walk with the Lord? Because if those two things don't add up together, something's wrong. It doesn't mean every day we're just perfectly strolling along with the Lord and we don't have any problems. We got problems. I could go through this whole parking lot and see that everybody's facing different things right now. But even though we face those things, does my faith equal the way I'm walking? Paul said, man is justified, justified by faith not the deeds of the law. Faith 
produces works. We're not saved by works, but if you say you have faith, faith will produce fruit into our lives. If there's no fruit in our walk with Christ, then faith is not at the forefront of our walk. Go to the book of James, if you will. It's right after Hebrews. James chapter uh, 2. It's windy up here, but I thank the Lord for the breeze, even though it's hot air. James chapter 2. Works. Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to him, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Faith produces works. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. This, this scripture struck me that even the demons believe and tremble. But you, do you want to know, foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted for righteousness, counted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works, not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when, we, when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as a body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Can I examine my life? Am I willing to examine my life and say, does my faith, does my action of faith equal my walk? Why is this so critical? Because, close walk, we're in the days of the end. It is critical that we have this thing right on this side for when we get to the other side. We want to please the Lord. My faith produces my works naturally. We want others to come to saving faith through the gospel. If that's not our heart, something's wrong. Closer walk, the clock is ticking. In these last days, God has given us a beautiful gift. And it's a gift of repentance. I wrote an article nine years ago in the paper about repentance. So as I went for a jacuzzi this morning, the lady that opens the door hands me the article. And it's on repentance. And she goes, I was going through my papers and I found this. Thought you might like it. What's the chance that the lady would send me, give me that paper of repentance when I want to teach on it this morning? See, repentance to me is a beautiful gift. It is a beautiful gift from God that keeps giving for us. And for those that don't know Jesus, it's also a beautiful gift. Repentance is a Greek word, meneteo, and it means this. I change my mind 
about which way I'm going and I turn and go the other way. That's the gift of repentance. I've had a lot of repentance lately in my heart as the Lord continues to deal with me on life and things in my life and how to correct things and how to be a better pastor, how to be a better preacher, how to be a better husband and father and so on. But repentance should really be in my side all the time. See, repentance is a beautiful gift that God gave mankind. But we've turned it into a word that we can't use and we won't use. But it's a radical turn. And what it really means is that I'm going to give God unconditional surrender of my life. Unconditional surrender. God, I surrender everything to you. You're always right. I'm always wrong. I completely surrender my life to you. See, repentance in religion is weird because repentance in religion is to keep God happy so he continues to bless them. Of course, that's false repentance. True repentance is to tap into the joy of our union with Jesus and to make my flesh weak of anything that's contrary to God's control. Anything. Let me read that again to you. True repentance is to tap into the joy of our union with Jesus and to make my flesh weak against anything contrary to God's heart. James is tapping and targeting this. My faith is my example. My faith is my example. My faith is my example. My faith is a driving force for doing good and for doing good works. We're not saved by works. We know that. Works just come naturally by faith. In Romans, they have the opposite problem. They place their faith in their performance. And by the way, our faith is not our faith anyways. It's his faith. Amen? And, 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 and if that's true, and it is, then my faith comes from him. But my faith is strengthened by the recognition of Christ in me, the hope of glory. Christ in me strengthens my faith, no matter what contradicts that. If you take gold in rock, you put it in a furnace, and the heat on that rock brings up all the dross, so that the gold is refined. Sometimes the heat of life will bring up the dross in our life to repent of so that the gold faith will shine. And I just believe six weeks ago or so, the Lord brought me the fear of the Lord as I was laying in bed and I began to weep bitterly like a baby. See, I know I'm saved. I know I'm saved. I know I'm not going to get more saved. But now I'm saved. I want to go to a deeper place in my faith with him. Therefore, God's got to get some dross in my life up to the top, and that's what he's been doing. And it hasn't been easy. It's not an easy journey to get the dross of your life up to the surface. See, really, you got to have an honest conversation with God and say, God, my, my, I want my faith to be like Jesus' faith, to be activated like his is. What needs to change in me? See, what happens is the testing of the gold always produces the hidden value in it. The hidden value of the, of the gold is hidden with the dross. And as the heat comes on it, the dross rises and then you see the hidden value of gold or the hidden value of faith. See, the hidden value of my faith has to come by the dross that raises up 
and the hidden value of what Christ is in me has to come to the surface. Now, maybe you say, well, that's not for me. Okay. See, the heat of the furnace isn't about the dross. It's about the gold, the hidden value. The heat brings the hidden value of what God wants. It's not about the heat or the dross. It's about the gold. And the gold is a gift of repentance. Go to First Peter, if you will. A book over from James, I believe it is. Chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 17. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now if the righteous is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Those that don't obey the gospel, their end is destruction. And according to this statistic, 92% of the world's population doesn't know the gospel. That is a stunning number if that's correct. See, the judgment here is not condemnation. The judgment here is not judgment of condemnation. We've already been judged. We were judged at the cross, and we were found not guilty by Jesus Christ who died in our place. This scripture is not about condemnation. This scripture is about purifying. This scripture is about purifying. And not only purifying, discipline, the, the sanctification process, the chasing in of the Lord. Ephesians says that God, not us, God, will present to himself a church without spot and without blemish. God will present himself a church. God himself will present himself a church. We don't present ourselves. He does. He will present himself a church without spot and without wrinkle in order for God to do that, to prevent, to provide himself a church without spot and wrinkle. Sometimes life has to give you heat to get the dross up to the top so that the spots and wrinkles can be behind us. Why is the repentance so unpopular? I'm going to tell you why repentance is so unpopular. Selfishness and self-centeredness. See, repentance is really submission. Submission. It's a change. William, you're going this way. It's the wrong way. You're saying this. It's the wrong saying. You're doing this. It's the wrong doing. Turn, William. Change your mind, William. Turn away from that. Yes, Lord, I submit to you, and I will change that. And as we change, the dross is pushed to the side. See, today there's, a little, there's very little fear of the Lord. And without the fear of the Lord, there will, be no, there will be no repentance. So let's look at repentance. Go to Revelation chapter 2, if you will. Revelation 2, a few more books over. Revelation 2, verse 5. Remember, therefore, now Jesus is talking to the churches. The seven churches. Therefore, remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Go over to verse uh, 21. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her in a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. I will give each one of you according to your works. Go over to chapter 3 verse 3 Remember therefore how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore if you will not watch I will come upon you as a thief and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Go over to verse 19. As many as I loved I rebuke and chasten. As many as I love I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come in and dine with him and he will be with me. I want you to look at the what happens of those that don't repent? Go over to chapter 9. 
verse 20. This is the tribulation period. Look what it says. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of their works of their hands that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Go over to chapter 16, verse 8. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the, the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent or give him glory. People don't realize the beautiful gift of repentance. On September 26th, there's a call for our nation to repent. We're going to host a time on this property that we're not only going to call our church, but all the churches in our nation to cry out to God to forgive us what we've done in our land to Him and against Him. Also, at 8 o'clock every night, you can pray for one minute for our nation, for God to turn us back to Him. Terry Rankin will be leading this uh, thing on the 26th. As I get ready to close, I want to bring this all together. Go to Matthew chapter 16, if you will. Matthew 6, verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on the earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore the eye is good, your whole body is full of light. But if the eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food? The, more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you of not more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need, of all, you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for today is its own trouble. God knows what's going on in our world. Do you remember Palm Sunday? you remember that day? <clears throat> When Jesus was going into Jerusalem and they were laying the branches down, remember the story? Can everybody nod their head? So, so they're all laying down the palm branches and they're, Hail! Hail King Jesus! And they're laying down these palm branches. What they wanted was they wanted deliverance from the political system of Rome. Much like today. What they needed was deliverance from sin. From sin. They needed deliverance from sin. This is why God has to deal with the human race this way. There's so much pride in the world and in the church. God hates pride. It is the root cause of all trouble. And the Bible continues to expose it. What if we 
put as much effort into sin as we did into other things. Not effort in sin, effort not to sin. As we put as much effort into other things. For me, most of my life has been prideful. And the Lord has been dealing with me on pride. It's a conversation we've been having for quite some time. To know God is to have an honest conversation with Him about your life. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith or not. Examine yourselves to see whether we're walking in faith. Lord, if pride's in my life, please remove the pride out of my life. The Bible says God will humble the exalted and exalt the humble. So why repentance? Why repentance? Because pride is in the way. Many of our hearts will be humble. For all of us, may pride be in the past. And may repentance become a beautiful gift in our walk with the Lord. All through history, we've had trouble. This is nothing new for our country or the world. God says he will exalt the humble. What that means is God will use the humble. God will open great doors for the humble. God will bring people to you when you're humble. The opposite of humility is pride. Paul was given a thorn or a stake driven into his flesh because of all the revelation he had about the Lord. And God said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. May we leave today in a spirit of repentance. May we leave today saying, God, get the draws out of my life. One day, you're going to be standing somewhere, or laying down somewhere, and all of a sudden, you're going to be in the clouds looking at Jesus. I suggest for all of us, it's the time to examine whether we're walking in faith or not. For me, I will lead that charge week after week as God exposes my sin, exposes my weakness, exposes my pride, exposes things that he wants to correct. May you be blessed. May you be encouraged by today. We love you and thank you so much for taking your time. May you be encouraged and we'll see you next week.